Can get, let's get started again. And I uh, would uh, like Mark Stevenson to come here. Uh, Mark has been uh, asked to say what has changed in the dairy business since 2009 and uh, how much of that is because of genomics or because of other factors. And I think he will also challenge some of the ideas that we already heard this morning. So I'm curious to know what Mark is going to say. So Mark is from the uh, University of Mad uh, Wisconsin-Madison. He has always uh, delivered very interesting and challenging ideas for the future of the industry. Well, thank you. I, uh, I appreciate that. You know, somehow I always feel like in audiences like this, I really should be introduced with that Monty Python uh, introduction that says, and now for something completely different. But uh, that's the job of the dairy economist. Um, we've had some interesting ideas tossed out this morning. And, you know, I formulate a lot of my own ideas. I certainly had a background in production agriculture. I started out as a dairy science student and transformed into ag economics. And, you know, you begin to see the world just a little bit differently from that perspective. And what I wanted to talk a little bit about, I think, forms some of the environment in which we're trying to work, bringing these um, production uh, tools, the, the new tools, into a dairy industry. They will face you know, economic consequences, as uh, we have to think a little bit about how does these uh, new uh, technologies become adopted, and what are the pressures that we see um, that are providing us um, guidance. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about some background information. One of these is uh, just to ask ourselves a question, where is milk being produced? And uh, Jack gave us the you know, 70,000 foot level, I think, uh, showing us a little bit of something about uh, around the world. But within the US, um, you can see that on a fairly granular basis, milk production doesn't just take place in a state. In fact, we produce milk still in all 50 states although it's my understanding that Hawaii is about to um, you know, reduce its number of dairy herds by 50%. Um, and we still have two dairy farms that are licensed for milk sales in the state of Alaska. But we produce milk in all 50 states. You can see, however, that even within those states, there's a lot of areas of density where milk is actually produced. And this tells us something about where the milk is. We also need to know where our customers are. And when we aren't thinking outside our borders, we're thinking about the population centers of the US. And they tend to be in regions that can be close to where dairy cows are, but increasingly are becoming uh, more or less distant. You can see these little darker colored spots around the country, and you can certainly name the cities that are associated with those regions. Um, but we can do a calculation as well that looks at the all milk equivalent consumption of dairy products on a per capita basis and multiply that by the number of people, uh, including the ethnicities in different areas. And we can subtract that from the milk that's available. Now, admittedly, this is kind of a uh, simplified view of the world. But when we look at this as a net deficit calculation, it tells us something about the supply chain that has to take the raw product from where it's being produced make it into the products we want to consume, and get them to our customers. This map is showing you milk deficit regions and surplus regions around the uh, country. The red to pink colors are showing areas that are well short of milk needs, and the uh, strongest um, areas of this are in the northeastern seaboard area from Boston on down through Washington. Those dark red colors there are just indicating that there's a great deal of milk shortage in that localized area. But the states of New York and Pennsylvania and Vermont in and of themselves are a net surplus. So they're certainly supplying milk into those deficit regions. But if we take a look at some of the broader swaths of the country, um, you can notice that the entire southeastern part of the country now, if we look at this as a whole, is about 41 billion pounds of milk net deficit on an annual basis. So it's the job of our dairy industry 
um, to get milk from where it's being produced, made into the products needed, and moved to these deficit areas and regions. We do have surplus areas too, of course, like the upper Midwest and the far west. Um, some of those very, very dense. The final map I'm going to show you is just a map that is taking a look at how we have evolved recently, the last 10 years or so of um, milk production. This is a change in milk intensity. The shades of red to pink are areas where we've lost milk production. Um, the shades of green are areas that have grown in milk production, and those buff colored areas are a little bit up, a little bit down, um, or in general uh, haven't changed too much. So that region that's of the southeast that I'm still highlighting here is showing you that it not only is net deficit as we stand, but is becoming more so all the time. This is in part due to population growth in the region, more people down there, but it's also clearly due to loss in milk production in that area. And I've scratched my head a lot of times and looked at case studies of regions of states or um, territories of the country as to when milk production has grown and why. Um, how can we explain that or how has milk contracted or been moving away and why. In the southeast, I think that a big part of the story down there is what has been alluded to today and the needs for genetics to have animals that are better adapted to the um, climate of the area. It's hot and it's humid down there and cows don't like that increasingly. Um, if you look at that little center part of the map, you'll notice that there are some red arrows in there and they go back to uh, 1960 at the far right side of that red arrow, move on their way out to 2010. Those are what's called centroids of milk production. It's a geographically weighted average. So in 1960, if you had to stick a pin in the map and just say, where is the center of milk production in um, the contiguous 48 states, it would have been down in southern Illinois. Over the decades since that time period, it has moved a little bit to the north and uh, to the west primarily. Um, and we are now questioning, you know, I guess where might that next arrow be when 2020 wraps around and we've got the milk production for that time period. I don't know if any of you would casual or hazard a guess, but um, I can imagine that that milk production arrow may well have moved back toward the east a little bit and more toward the north. Um, we certainly have seen growth in different regions of the country. The other thing to recognize is that the growth in milk production, and that's what this chart is showing you, it's milk production by herd size categories. Just to give you an idea, that very small, thin blue strip at the bottom um, are herds that are th less than 30 cows. Um, and we move on up, as you can see by the, uh, uh, the chart there. Uh, to the top wedge, which is the milk production in herds of 2,000 cows or more. The only growth that we have had over this time period in milk production by herd size category has been in the area of 1,000 cows or more. All of the other herd size categories have contracted. Now, admittedly, some of our farms have graduated from the herd size category they were in up to a larger herd size, but we've also lost just an awful lot of farms um, over the years. But keep in mind that um, at the last time we had good production data by herd size category was at the last um, census, agricultural census, in 2013. And at that point in time, more than 53% of milk production in this country was coming from our largest 3% of herds. If we follow the simple trend lines as I've done from that red line forward, um, by the time we get out to 2020, we'll have two thirds of the milk in this country being produced on those relatively few um, smaller or large farms. So herd structure um, is, is clearly uh, one of the uh, demographics that's impacting uh, what is being adopted in the way of technologies, what is possible in the way of what we can do and uh, what we're likely to achieve. I want to shift gears just a little bit. We've talked about uh, the kind of improved efficiency we've seen over time. If I go back to my age of awareness back in the early 70s when I was coming out into the field, 
You'll notice that, you know, we were at about an average in the U.S., about 10,000 pounds of milk per cow. That is perhaps the most persistent and relentless trend um, that I can think of in all of agriculture. Sure, we have trends of increased productivity for corn and soybeans and almost everything else, but they have a great deal of variation from year to year, impacted by things like weather. But this trend looks almost as though we put a ruler on it and, and simply drew it going in an um, upward direction. Um, and, of course, we have entire states that have milk production higher than our 23 to 24,000 pound U.S. average now. Uh, Michigan, I think, is um, approaching 27,000 pounds of milk per cow. Uh, we have herds that are well above 30,000 pounds per cow, and of course we have individual animals that have achieved more than 70,000 pounds of milk in a year. I say this and I show you those previous maps because just recognize that as these animals get up into this kind of range and have become uh, greater and greater milk producers, um, they are high performing athletes in some sense and have a great deal of body heat to dissipate. And that body heat is not as easily dissipated in regions of the country like the southeast. This is just a, um, a chart that's showing you um, an idea about where are we comfortable or not comfortable. And of course, both heat and humidity come into uh, the mix when we're talking about that. If we take a look at our top four milk producing states in the United States, uh, that would be California, number one, that's in the red line. Wisconsin, number two in the blue line. Idaho, number, well, Idaho or New York have traded places a few times, but um, those two are in the yellow or green lines. I think you can see from something like this, and the reason this isn't the straight smooth trend is this is monthly, and so seasonal um, differences are showing up here as well as just the annual trend. But there's some very different trends going on here. Um, Wisconsin and New York uh, clearly had some room to go to catch up to states like California and Idaho, uh, but they've caught up now and in fact um, have often been above those other states. The other thing to notice is the kind of seasonality that you see, the ups and downs, the amplitude of those lines. The states in the West where we've seen uh, you know, strong milk production growth um, are also states that have greater seasonality. It's not as hot and humid there as it is in the southeast, but uh, at some point in time, hot is just plain hot. This was a little bit alluded to, I think, in Jack. He's talked about the climate change. I have a couple slides that I think are worth talking about here. This is a change, or what they call temperature anomalies, um, in global um, Earth temperatures. Now we can debate what man's impact on this has been versus some natural changes and shifts that do take place. It doesn't really matter. The point is, it is happening. And if we take a look at the time that was considered to be the numerarian in here, this you know, 1940s through about 1970, um, it's obvious that since the 70s we've had a tremendous increase in global surface temperatures. Now, admittedly, this is only getting up toward an additional one degree Celsius, but that, if you think about it, over the entire surface of the globe, represents tremendous amount of energy that's being captured and held in the Earth's surface <coughs> from the sun. And it is throwing increasingly um, bizarre weather patterns for us. I was a little bit surprised that this report came out in November, um, given our current administration's um, uh, desire to not have a great deal of climate change discussion having happened. But this was a, a report from the federal government uh, with a headline that climate change will have dire consequences for the U.S. And as they focused down and drilled into this report a little bit, by the way, I would encourage some of you to read this if you um, would like to. This is a, uh, not a uh, political report. This is simply a report of science. But they talk about agriculture, and they do talk about some of the impacts of agriculture, even getting down to dairy. I circled down there that it says heat stress could cause average dairy production to fall between six-tenths of a percent and 1.5 percent over the next 12 years, having already cost the industry um, from heat stress in 2010. 
So heat stress is a big deal. But I don't think that this takes place um, just anywhere. If we look at what we've been seeing increasingly in weather patterns, um, the oceans tend to capture an awful lot of the heat that we're getting in terms of the uh, global climate temperatures. And El Nino events in the Pacific are one example of them, but when we get the heat building up along the coasts there, certainly we have more fires um, in the west and, and other things that can be observed, but it also caused what the climatologists call a buckling in the, uh, um, in the jet stream. And this buckling in the jet stream can actually cause cooler than normal temperature patterns uh, in some regions of the country. And notably, that's where I live. Uh, we had a nasty buckle in the jet stream here this winter, uh, an entire week when it never saw above zero degree temperature, and in fact uh, hit minus 25. And this isn't wind chill I'm talking about. This is real temperatures, um, you know, for uh, several nights that week. Okay, so um, when we look at some of these shifts that have been occurring in where milk's produced, uh, we also have to take a look at some of our infrastructure in the dairy industry. This map is showing you by circles um, the locations of major um, dairy plants in the country, and the size of the circle is meant to be indicative of something like the volume of milk processed at those plants. Again, we have plants all over the country. But I'm highlighting three states up here because uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and New York uh, in this three-year time period from 2015 through 2017 had increased milk production uh, an average of 15 million pounds of milk per day. So, you know, these are small increases, but when you're talking about, you know, three of our top five milk producing states, it represents a lot of milk. And 15 million pounds of milk today is roughly three large dairy plants. And we didn't have three large dairy plants built in that area during that period of time. This causes stress on our systems. And at the same time, I might just point out that California had been losing milk production uh, for those three years. They've, they've had some um, increase this past year, but their loss of milk production was equivalent to about 8 million pounds of milk per day, and two powder plants out there had closed down as a result of that. So these shifts can be costly in terms of infrastructure. Just to give you an example, during this time period, this is data from the Northeastern uh, Federal Milk Marketing Order. And we always have a little bit of milk that gets dumped in federal orders. Uh, a load arrives and it's above temperature, um, so it's condemned. Or perhaps antibiotic was found in the milk and it gets condemned and dumped. But um, that black line would show you in 2013 something like our normal <coughs> amount of milk being dumped, which is pretty trivial. By the time we got to 2014 and some of this growth in milk production, we had a little bubble there, a spike in the middle of the year. Um, 2015, a little more. 2016, a lot more. 2017, quite a bit as well. This milk that was being dumped was simply because capacity was not being found to process all of the milk that was being produced. We can build plants. You know, Michigan is kind of the poster child for um, milk production growth here over the last several years. They've had a great deal of production growth, but they haven't had adequate plant capacity to handle all of it. And it's been spilling out, over the, out of the state, finding uh, processing homes wherever it could. Um, by my calculations, maybe as close uh, to 100 uh, tanker truck loads a day uh, we're leaving the state. That's expensive to haul. We can build plants, but they're an expensive um, piece of equipment to put in place. In fact, a modern plant, like one that's being built in Michigan right now, um, will cost more than half a billion dollars. Half a billion dollars. You don't make that investment lightly or without thinking about the future of that. Where do you put it? What products do you make with a plant like that? Who are your customers? All important questions, and how do you get your products from where they're processed to uh, where your customers are? 
You know, as we've seen some of this happening, there's been downward pressure on milk prices in regions of the country. And one of the things I find happening more today and happened last time after 2009 as we were headed into the uh, farm bill uh, uh, that became the farm bill of 2014 was that there's more discussions um, about some form of supply management. Not that we don't need more milk, not that we can't use it, but can we have more controlled growth um, than we've had in the past. By the way, I'm not advocating any one policy or another. I'm just saying that I do hear a lot more discussions about this. Premiums are something that we have a difficult time observing directly, but we can look at them indirectly. We can compare the U.S. all milk price or state all milk prices um, to the federally regulated prices in the region. And if you do, you get an implied idea about a premium. This is um, the pressure on premiums that was happening for the state of Michigan um, during that time period of having so much excess milk. And while I didn't carry this out another uh, year or so, um, we would find that we've had uh, a falling of premiums in states of New York and Wisconsin as well. And this is largely because of just surplus milk in the region. Let me shift gears again. I want to talk about our customers outside the borders, now our export customers. Exports have grown a lot. That blue line that's on there is um, a 12-month rolling average of exports um, shown on the left-hand axis as a percent of milk production. And it had been common for us to have both imports and exports at something like 3 to 4 percent of our production for many, many years going back. But by the time we got to about 2005, um, we changed. We became a major exporter to the world markets. And you can see that that trend has been generally going up with a few exceptions. Um, we have on the right-hand axis over here the U.S. all milk price on a monthly basis, in, and that's shown in orange on the graph. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to correspondence of some time periods. Exports have been great, but there are times when our exports tail off a little bit for whatever reason. Maybe there's more competition from other exporting countries. Uh, maybe demand has declined. Um, you know, as certainly was the case here in 2009, we had worldwide recession, and some of our um, countries that we were exporting to just didn't want as much milk. Or maybe it's things like trade wars. Um, that happens too. Whatever the reason, you can look at the correspondence between these being off trend in this milk production and exports and what happens to milk price. It seems to be the case that almost every time we're off for a period of time, we have a pretty tremendous decline in milk price. And it doesn't recover until we get back on trend with exports. That seems to be the case again now in our current time period. Well, when we don't export as much as we intended to, storable dairy products tend to back up into our milk production uh, and supplies. And you can see that the stock levels of American cheese had grown through 2015, 16, 17, and yes, here in 18. Uh, this unexpected increase here at the end of the year uh, was really what gave rise to the uh, loss of class three prices or the decline in class three prices over the last quarter of uh, 2018. Let's talk just a little bit about trade with some of our partners like Canada. Now, we never have had an opportunity to sell very much dairy product to Canada. They have a very tightly controlled system up there. But we had started to sell a product called milk protein isolates to them. And the reason we were able to do that was because at the time the trade negotiations were, were done originally, that product didn't exist. And so when a tanker load of this milk protein isolate came to customs going into Canada, um, they looked at the uh, load of tearing and would have said, yeah, no, this is fine, go ahead, take it in. Um, but that was a problem for Canadian dairy farmers. And they have a classified pooling and pricing system, much like we do, or at least similar to ours. Um, and they were able to effectively halt a lot of the sales of that product by changing a pricing in here. This was showing you just the monthly sales of this MPI product into Canada and what happened after they changed 
uh, to their so-called class seven pricing. This also was milk that was coming from just a couple of, well, actually three plants in the US. One of them located here in Wisconsin and one of them located here in New York, two of them in New York, excuse me. Um, roughly similar volumes of product in both states, but overnight that product stayed home. Uh, when that happened, of course, we had farms that lost markets. Big investments on farms uh, don't like losing markets overnight. It's a terrifying thing to go through. And did I mention trade? Well, yeah, we've had some other trade-related issues going on, um, not just those uh, that I've mentioned before. Uh, but we're starting to settle some of this. This is the milk price variation that we've seen in the U.S. Um, you know, going back a, a couple of years, a lot of up and down for sure. When we looked at this 2009 time period relative to the uh, milk price prior to that, this felt like a deep plunge down here. But it was in fact so deep that it caused us to contract milk production fairly quickly and we recovered. And then we had other things going on, like opportunities to sell a lot of dairy product overseas that took us to 2014 prices. And of course, happy as we were, we overproduced for the market. And now we've been in this kind of period of time. This is an unusually long period, not because it's as low as it was back in 2009, but because of its persistence. Let's look at a couple of our products. We all know the story of fluid milk. It has been declining in sales uh, for some period of time. But it was about 2010, and I can't actually say that I know all the reasons why all of a sudden we had this turn of a corner and we've been in steep decline. Oh, I know, plant-based beverages were part of the reason, but they can't be the whole reason because we had soy milk all the way back in here. So, you know, there were some other things going on, too. But it's not been all bad news. My goodness, take a look at cheese. Um, again, my age of awareness was back here when we were barely eating uh, 13 pounds of cheese per capita. But uh, we've really picked up the pace. We're now at about 37 pounds per capita. And, um, you know, lest you think that trend is out of steam, I think we have opportunities because countries like France or Germany uh, their consumption is more like 50 pounds per capita. So we've got room to grow. I point out these two categories because they um, refer to one other thing that's, I think, really critically important for us. Our milk use has changed. Obviously, we're putting less of the proportion of that milk into the bottle and more of it going into manufactured dairy products. Jack said that. He said, we're eating our food now, or our, our dairy now, not drinking it. And at the time that federal milk marketing orders were started, you'll notice that about 65% of the milk production was uh, class one and about uh, 35 was class three. Today, it's about 30% class one, the rest of it manufactured dairy products. So it's not as much milk in federal milk marketing orders going into that, and um, that represents a lot less money in your milk check. Um, in fact, uh, in some regions like the upper Midwest or California, it's about 1% of your milk check. So there's less to fight about here. Just a few observations then. Milk's growing in some regions, taxing plant capacity. Production growth has been almost exclusively in the larger herds, milk's declining. What happens when these trends collide? Well, um, you know, we tax our food system. Regional milk production patterns change, and so do food systems. I think the relentless pursuit of increased yields per cow may also be slowing just a bit as we focus on other traits that are more important. Um, trade's been good for the industry, but there are downsides to trade, greater volatility in prices. So with that, we just have the summaries. Um, trends in productivity are pushing against climate. Um, we've seen a lot of growth in the northeastern states relative to the west and southwest. Plant capacity can be an issue. And changes in how much milk is produced and where are expressed as changes in milk prices. Exports are the things that move our milk prices up and down. But those regional shifts are changing the relative values of milk in different parts of the country. And that's important too. 
I wouldn't be surprised at some point in time if we see some form of supply management, most likely not a national program adopted, uh, that could become fairly common for us in, in our industry. And with that, I thank you.